Good day, everybody at AFSI and whoever else is, you know, we're pleased to have join us today. Um, from Israel today, we have Ron Schleifer. Ron has been in the world of academia and and as working as a lecturer and a writer for some 30 years. For the last 15 or so, he's been affiliated with Ariel University uh, as a chief lecturer and an expert on uh, defense and communications. Today, we're gonna to discuss Hamas's use of psychological warfare as it relates to Israel. Um, obviously, everybody on this who's listening here knows that there's so much going on um, both in Israel and around the world. Uh, there's a ton of challenges. Um, we're very lucky to have Ron join us today. Um, I'll, I'll be chiming in with some questions here and there and maybe ask for some clarifications. But in the meantime, we're gonna get started right away and uh, I'll introduce Ron Sch Schleifer. Thank you so much for joining us, Ron. Yeah, thank you for having me. So so with that, can you uh, talk about maybe over the last you know, number of years, your background and then and then just the last few weeks, going on four weeks, what's happened uh, with with the attacks, the massacre, the brutal massacre, and uh, your insight as to the use of psychological warfare by Hamas. Okay, I was a student in the Hebrew University uh, some 40 years ago. I, I did my master's in, uh, in the communication um, department uh, at the time. And I was looking uh, to do a PhD on, on Israeli Hasbara. I've been chasing a, an alleged box where somebody was collecting the PLO propaganda, but it never materialized. I didn't find that one. So uh, I asked for people to, uh, for supervisors and they didn't, they, nobody wanted to supervise me. It was the uh, the heyday of the Oslo Agreement, uh, and all the academia was in a in a stupor, in in a um, in a in a, I don't know in in the mood of uh, of peace and and uh, propaganda was still is uh, perceived as a dirty subject which nobody wants it to touch. So I went to uh, England. I did a PhD. I came back and I've been uh, teaching um, the elements of psychological warfare, especially in the Middle East, ever since. So um, what is psychological warfare? It's, uh, you know, very basically, I would say, this is the use of nonviolent methods uh, in order uh, to promote uh, the victory in war. And... Uh, well, uh, normally every effort is in war is violent, but psychological warfare is essentially not violent. And uh, well, there, uh, there's been so much progress in in research on how to persuade people. Well, um, we are buying. I don't want to offend anybody, but. Uh, we are buying insurance policy and would pay thousands of dollars and we get a piece of paper which we're quite sure that it will be worthless once we uh, once we need it. Uh, we drink coffee, which is uh, not so healthy. Uh, we use our cell phones. We know it radiates. Uh, so, I mean, persuasion is uh, is very effective. So why not use it for uh, the purpose of winning a war? And not surprisingly, um, in the, a, an army or a site to a conflict who has uh, submarines and uh, and and uh, aircraft uh, and, and all the modern weaponry um, is tending to rely on its uh, physical strength. And those who don't rely on their, uh, on their uh, let's call it the mental capability, uh, because if you cannot match the gun of the enemy, um, so what you can do is to try to persuade your, your enemy not to pull the trigger, which has the same effect essentially, because if he's not using it, it means that 
that is not shooting at you. Um, I'll, I'll give you an example in the in the conflict in Kosovo, uh, where uh, NATO and the U.S. Air Force uh, was bombing uh, bombing in, in Kosovo. Um, so um, students from the I think was Croatian or uh, Bosnian I don't remember on uh, one side they were uh, sending uh, via email the photographs of the results of the bombing the damage the uh, the carnage uh, the collateral damage meaning uh, harmed civilians they were sending it to the families of the pilots where they found their their uh, email addresses on an open website of the uh, of the flight squadron where the pilots uh, uh, belong in the army and uh, and to show uh, and to show the families of the pilots what are the results of their of their actions um, that created quite a stir and opened the uh, the channel uh, to understanding what can persuasion do in wartime. Uh, and Hamas is the same story. Uh, Hamas doesn't have uh, that doesn't have uh, uh, large uh, ships. It doesn't have missile boats. It doesn't have uh, submarines, nuclear submarines. It doesn't have tanks. So what he has, he is trying to persuade the uh, Israelis um, not to use the weapons. And pretty much it's succeeding. It was uh, as a part of a great deception plan devised by Iran um, to, let's say, to lull the Israeli um, society in general to um, get the peop the uh, decision decision makers uh, to decide uh, and to shape their perspective on the matter uh, to shape it as to fit the Hamas interests. So basically it's a classical uh, operation of psychological warfare. So it, with regard to the psychological warfare that Hamas is engaging in, um, it, as I listen to you, it seems to me that there may be psychological warfare coming from lots of other places, um, not only other Iranian proxies, but also maybe, let's say, from the American government or world governments that are also, you know, leaning on Israel not to to use their weapons like you spoke about. Um, maybe that's, I don't know if I'm off base there, and it would also seem like psychological warfare from Hamas might be being used on the people that fight for Hamas. I mean, that they're being, it, it maybe that's a incorrect use, but okay. to get them brainwashed into being, to wanting to give their life to, yeah. to this whole thing. Okay. Um, so psychological warfare works on three main target audiences. First of all, on the home audience, because if they don't support you, as America has found uh, in Vietnam, so that will greatly impair the uh, the war effort. And the main target audience of psychological warfare, let's say the second main audience of the psychological warfare is the enemy. You try to lower its morale, to try to persuade it he, he is unjust. You try to persuade them that at the end they're going to uh, fail anyway. So why prolong the suffering uh, and the bloodletting and all that? And finally, the uh, third important uh, target audience are the neutrals, those who are not directly connected to uh, um, to the conflict, but uh, have an influence uh, in one way or another. Uh, and when you come to Israel, um, the home audience you call the appeal to the home audience you you call it like communications to show it to the enemy you call it psychological warfare. Actually, you don't call it psychological warfare because it keep the, the title keeps changing all the time. Uh, it was called legitimacy. 
uh, which is a horrible name, like Israel is looking for the only state, uh, the only country in the world that is seeking uh, the legitimacy for its existence. Um, now it's called influence, Hashpa. Now it's called influence. Uh, this is in uh, you know in a nutshell, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, appeal to the target or to the uh, neutrals. Uh, Israelis call it Hasbara. Uh, which has no parallel in, in any other language other than German, in which in German you can say anything you want. Um, the nearest, uh, the nearest uh, equivalent in English to Hasbara is advocacy. And um, Israel is trying to persuade unsuccessfully um, uh, to the, the neutral countries, why uh, are we are right and why they should support us. Um, so I'm going to, uh, so this, uh, this uh, session is about the second target audience, the enemy uh, to, towards Hamas. And what Hamas is doing uh, is trying to persuade Israel Oh, let's say Hamas is persuaded, let's say from the home audience of Hamas. The strongest um, indoctrination of Hamas are the jihadis who train children from a very early age to love death. They conduct many of the sessions in there in, um, not only in the mosques, but in cemeteries. And uh, they make them um, make them familiar with death, uh, with the procedure, and this is the most desired goal. Um, and afterwards, uh, there is another circle uh, that Hamas is indoctrinating uh, is indoctrinating its youth. Uh, for the hatred of Israel and uh, the importance of uh, using uh, uh, weapons, so they train children how to use uh, guns, uh, etc. And then when they grow, they uh, gradually bring them uh, to the military wing uh, or other supporting uh, auxiliary uh, branches that support the military wing. And they, since they realize very wisely, so they realize that they cannot match the IDF, so they put a lot of effort in the, in the, into psychological warfare, into persuading Israel first that it's not going to win at the end, in the long run, that its society is weak and it's unjust, that uh, um, they are going to fail because they are godless and uh, and Hamas is has much more right because it says so in the Quran. Uh, and uh, even though the, uh, the their army is mighty and strong, at the end it's going to uh, it's going to fall to fall apart. So, um yeah so with that um do you believe that they're having their psychological warfare is having success on the second group on yes. the enemy yes yes i'll tell you i'll tell you how it works um the beginning of uh, the plo uh was as we all know was uh, an operation of uh, of the soviet union and they told uh, uh, Arafat uh, after the Six Day War uh, to go to Vietnam and to see how the Vietnamese are going to chase away the Americans. And the general who taught them that uh, was, was called General Giap. And he taught them that the political aspect of the struggle is much more important than the military. And he taught them all the techniques which he used against America, like uh, building uh, the ammunition uh, factories uh, next to the workers' uh, workers' homes. So whenever American Air Force would bomb the ammunition factories, 
They would also bomb the homes of the workers. And then he would call in the media to show to show that, uh, and then would raise a lot of criticism within the American society, etc. So Arafat uh, deployed that in Lebanon. He was shooting from schools and from uh, and from hospitals, etc. Now um, in the 80s, um, many of the PLO moved on, PLO activists move on to uh, to the Hamas. It was partly because they became from, they became religious. It was partly because Hamas offered more, um, I don't know, a more promising career. And they taught Hamas the uh, the principle. And with any, like any, like many other, except for the Jewish revolutionary movement, uh, you actually seek the active involvement uh, of the enemy against your own civilians, which is designed, now I come to the uh, psychological warfare, which is designed to evoke feelings of guilt among the enemy. Now, when you see a baby which is ripped apart by a bomb, you, no way you can remain impartial because babies do not belong in war. And so women and so the elderly, uh, they don't. So what the, the, the cynical and the evil of this strategy, this is how America was chased out of Vietnam, was deployed in many other places uh, and was deployed here in Israel. So a lot of Israelis felt the shame and the guilt as a result of, uh, of Israeli actions, which was initiated by, by Hamas. So this is just but one example. Um, the other, uh, a, other uh, mechanism is to persuade, uh, I mean, psychological mechanism is to persuade the enemy that keeping its policy is going to be a liability rather than an asset. So it was working very effectively with the PLO, which was doing its phased uh, plan. Like, let's first of all, let's do, let's have a, an independent Palestinian state, and then we'll see. Well, Hamas doesn't work like that. Hamas has a charter which says we are going to destroy you and throw you into the sea unless you convert to Islam or you or you run away. So in the long term, it's um, just like that uh, Churchill demanded that um, the Germany will uh, will have unconditional surrender. Uh, and which gave Goebbels a good excuse to um, to raise the um, um, what's the word to raise the uh, not objection the resistance against uh, against um, the Allies. Look, non-conditional resistance meaning that they're going to kill you. So um, uh, Hamas is saying we are going to kill you. It doesn't matter for how long, and it doesn't matter um, how you're going to react. This is going to be the end result. Um, this message of resistance, of uh, um, uh, of um, what's the word, um, steadfastness, etc., uh, is very convincing. And uh, and people say, let's buy some, let's buy some peace and quiet. Let's give them what they want for now. So this is uh, this is how the mechanism it's, works. Um, it seems it's like an ongoing cycle. It's just a, it's an escalation, yes. but it seems like an ongoing cycle. And it's great. I mean, it's very interesting to hear such a long term perspective because so many people are paying close attention. The AFSI group aside, because they're pretty, you know you know, clued into all of this and passionate about their love of Israel. Um, but so it's great to hear your long-term perspective speaking about, you know, Vietnam and World War II and, you know, and, and, and all the different analogies. But um, we also like to think here, I think that 
you know, the Israelis are unified for victory here at this time, and that having seen what the brutality of the attacks and the massacres that were done on October 7th maybe makes them feel, you know, while they hate to see children in 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 uh, in Gaza, you know, killed and you know what however it may be, because they're hiding because they're hiding behind them, but they know that they it's something that they have to deal with. Um so I, I don't know. It sounds it sounds like you know, somebody, the, the theory is, is that they're just going to keep on coming and just keep on coming. And then there's so many other organizations or proxies of Iran, as people are starting to say more and more and understand better and better. Are they also using similar type psychological warfare? Or is Hamas is somewhat unique? Um, no, no. Uh, the reason why I went uh, back uh, to the Vietnam War, I can go back to the Second World War and can go back to the First World War. Right. The themes of and the the techniques of persuasion are always the same. What has changed is only the technology of delivering the messages. In the First World War, it was the newspaper. In the Second World War, it was the radio. In Vietnam, it was television. In the Gulf War, it was uh, it was the uh, CNN with. And um, and nowadays is the smartphone, okay? So uh, it's just that the, the technology changes. Well, you have to adapt to the technology, of course, uh, but the um, the persuasion strategies uh, remain the same. Um, what Hamas attacked, uh, what happened in that's the way that Israel. I mean the. In Israeli intelligence believes, and based on the uh, documents which were found among the uh, among the attackers, um, is that it should have been a coordinated attack uh, from the south and from the north. The, it did not happen because Hamas uh, made the attack earlier than scheduled uh, because he saw the uh, the music festival. And it just could not resist. So mm -hmm. they said, we're going to attack and uh, and you join us. Well, the Hezbollah said, which is probably much more uh, adherent to Iranian strategy, uh, Hezbollah said, uh, let's wait and see because it's not it's not uh, in it's not in the original plan. Uh, so what Hamas was doing is is uh, what uh, what is called shock and awe. Right. It should have been um, two or three weeks uh, later on uh, when uh, they were supposed to go back uh, into the Gaza Strip and find refuge in the tunnels, just like in Vietnam. Uh, they uh, they created the mayhem uh, on purpose and filmed everything and were about, which many of them did, um, were returned back to, uh, um, to, uh, to, the, to Gaza. But those who were not, a few hundreds were killed or taken prisoner. Uh, so we have the, uh, the visuals, which were they filming. Uh, they had, uh, they had um, GoPro cameras, uh, body cameras. Uh, which were supposed to take um, footage uh, from the invasion. Um, and uh, they were filming with cameras, with uh, smartphones. I'm not sure, I don't know, uh, well, I have to look it up, I have to ask around if they had uh, video, video cameras especially. Uh, which is designed for uh, you know, better quality of the, of the mayhem. Now, I don't call them Nazi. I don't call them uh, uh, atrocious. It's a calculated policy. It's a calculated strategy to uh, um, uh, to shock the enemy and and scare it and to uh, have the enemy paralyzed because of the fear. I mean, these people are monsters. Nothing that can do against such uh, such uh, creatures, um, and this is what they wanted us to think. 
And this is part of policy, which by the way, gives me a lot of academic trouble because it's uh, it, the fear which they invoke comes from violence. And what I'm advocating is, you know, uh, psychological warfare is nonviolent. So I would say that uh, the invasion was violent. The abduction of Gilad Shalit was violent, but the uh, media circus, which they, um, which they develop and which they use, after the abduction, this is psychological warfare. Uh, look how well we treat our uh, uh, our guests. I mean, your prisoners, our guests. Uh, they all get what they need. They all they look uh, look how clean they are. They look how uh, well fed they they are, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Unlike you, which you are torturing our our prisoners. Well, the uh, Hamas prisoners in Israeli jails, uh, they get degrees, yeah, and uh, they they bring uh, they they get food deliveries from nearby restaurants. So uh, so th this is this is the game. So the first stage was shock and awe. The second stage is you are the monsters and not us. And look how we treat your prisoners. And if you don't behave as we want you to then it's the, the blood of the prisoners is on your hands, the Israelis. So this is the mechanism, how it's going to work. So um, it's, it, it's pretty gloomy. It doesn't, it's not really a, an encouraging picture that you paint. Can I ask you, uh, I'm gonna ask you a couple more questions maybe. Um, first, is there, anything, is there anything encouraging or anything on a forward looking basis that you think can best be done to combat this psychological warfare that's being engaged against Israel, Hamas's enemy? Um, yes, there's a lot that uh, that could be done. At the moment, it is not done. The, at the moment, uh, let me put it this way. In During the war itself, uh, uh, Psychological warfare works between wars and after wars, um, which we want to change the opinions of uh, of the target audience, the and it's the enemy, the civilians, uh, the army. Uh, but in the war itself, what you want the enemy is what you want them to do, not to think. You want them to do, you want them to move from this place to another. You wanted them to surrender. You want them, you want them to uh, not to be too active on the battlefield if they are, don't want to actively surrender, uh, et cetera. Uh, so now the Israeli psychological warfare is about uh, a, is a, an appeal to the civilians uh, to move to the south of the Gaza Strip. Um, they, I saw a leaflet uh, which was uh, dropped from, uh, from a helicopter and was also on the internet, uh, but they don't have internet uh, at the moment in Gaza or they have problem with uh, electricity. Uh, so it is... Um, sent to them via uh, pieces of paper and say, if you know uh, the whereabouts of the um, Hamas uh, kidnap or Hamas, uh, Hamas operatives, uh, give us a call to this number, um, et cetera, et cetera. So if you want to save your life, you want to save your home, um, that information can be useful to us and will compensate you. So this is the type of appeals um, at the moment. Um, so this is what, what could be done. Now, what uh, could be done in a broader perspective? Uh, look, there are, we have hundreds of, uh, of uh, Hamas uh, attackers uh prison is uh, uh, our prisoners and the they also have mothers and they also have families uh and everybody declares uh yeah how willing uh, how are they willing to die uh, etc we love death you love uh, you love life 
therefore will win. But actually, maybe it's not that. Maybe we can put a crack in this process of indoctrination, what you were calling euphemistically uh, brainwashing. Uh, and uh, we can also play that against uh, against Hamas. We can uh, we can use, we can film them uh, how very small heroes they are without their guns and without their equipments, wearing orange uh, orange uh, suits, prison suits, uh, etc. Uh, that could be very discouraging. Um, I'm just giving uh, just one example. We, there's a lot that we can do. Um, yeah. No, I was going to say, I mean, unless it's something you want to add here, you know, I did want to keep it to uh, uh, not too long. We can maybe re-engage with you in another time. But I did, I know you mentioned, uh, you know, I know you've written a number of books and before we say goodbye and thank you. Maybe I know you recently published a book along with uh, Danny Seaman um, entitled "The The Coverage of Israel in the Foreign Media," which is obviously very related. It's it's, it's related on a bigger scale, like you said, more generally. Yeah. Um, yeah. So maybe you just want to touch on that for a minute for any of our listeners that uh, might be interested okay. in talking about that. Uh, I have a briefing for the media. Uh, in Jerusalem tomorrow, and I'm still debating whether to tell them that, but I can tell uh, AFSI, I can speak about that uh, openly. Uh, the psychological warfare operatives on any side, in any country, view the international media uh, merely as a channel. Uh, everybody speaks about, um, you know, watched off our democracy, etc. cetera, but, um, but, uh, in principle, from the perspective of psychological warfare, these are only channels to deliver uh, to deliver information, which is good for the and uh, you know supports the initiator. Uh, Israel has lost this battle decades ago. Decades ago, uh, first we uh, since we're a democracy, they can travel anywhere. The media can travel anywhere they want. Um, and uh, we did not threaten uh, the journalists' lives, just like the PLO and Hamas uh, were doing. Um, the, the situation in the past two decades has become very risky to the journalists. So what the, uh, what the media outlets have done, they relied on local stringers um in Gaza and in Judea and Samaria um and they deliver the stories and the credit is given uh to the newspaper or to the news agency uh and the angle of the story is always anti-israeli naturally of course because if you have a Hamas operative who is not using a gun is using a camera uh, and he knows what he's after. Um, therefore, they had the upper hand, and we lost this battle. And whenever, wherever uh, foreign journalists can uh, can travel, they also have uh, been indoctrinated in their home universities uh, about the Arab-Israeli conflict, and of course, uh, uh, Israel is the um, uh, is the oppressor, etc. And they have been uh, indoctrinated not only in university, in high schools, and even in primary schools. Um, Israel has neglected, unfortunately, uh, the uh, this arena. And uh, these are the consequences. Uh, the AP, or the news agency, which is the probably one of the most important uh, and effective media outlets, uh, its local uh, its local headquarters moved to Egypt, right from Jerusalem. So you can imagine the Egyptians uh, who are working for AP. Uh, are not going to be quite supportive of uh, the Zionist movement. Um, so this has been a long-going battle, and Danny Seaman, who was the head of the 
uh, government press office uh, took a lot of heat for uh, for many many years um, by um, very um, angry uh, journalists uh, when he would not give uh, um, newspaper uh, accreditation uh, media accreditation uh, to Palestinian stringers who used it for terrorism, etc. Uh, so this is what this book is about. And this is just one small aspect of the psychological warfare uh, in the huge campaign against Israel. There's certainly a battle against Israel going on so many fronts. You know, you, you think about different physical fronts and psychological fronts and media and education and and, and indoctrination, and it just keeps on going, and it's a big challenge, but hopefully um, Israel and the Jewish people are up to it and uh, can continue to, to, to be strong and hopefully find some victory, as I was saying earlier. I Oh, we will win, don't worry. We will win. We have no choice. We will win. And um, Hamas is taking a serious beating, uh, I can forecast that it will uh, announce its victory in the next few weeks, uh, even though it would lose Gaza uh, entirely. Um, but uh, what people can do is be more active, be more active on the uh, uh, on the social media, uh, be active on vigils, be active on demonstrations. Um, Governments are now changing heart and support Israel. It's happening in uh, it's happening in uh, in Europe, Eastern Europe, Eastern, Eastern Europe, Europe sure. and also part also in Western Europe. Um, there was a march of prime ministers going to visit uh, Netanyahu in the past few weeks, and so people ask me why. So I think, in my opinion. They want to know if this is the turning point uh, against uh, against radical Islam and the Islamification of uh, of Europe. Um, and since America is also undergoing a strong process of uh, Islamization, uh, so this is why is Israel now is uh, is enjoying a lot uh, a lot of support. Um, so that needs to be organized better. That would be should be channeled uh, better, and um, uh, students need to know how to uh, how to protect themselves, even physically. Uh, and Jewish communities have to learn how to protect themselves, uh, and uh, communities need to know the tenets uh, and the secrets of psychological warfare in order to turn the table against our enemies. It's doable. Well, it's good that you ended with us with a little bit of upbeat uh, uh, talk with a little hope and really some good optimism and confidence in your optimism. Um, I know America has caught up, damn. So I'm going to, my phone's ringing. I apologize. It's the other phone. So thank you so much again, Ron. We really appreciate you joining us today on behalf of AFSI, the entire organization. Um, thank you so much for joining us. We look forward to speaking with you again. We hope to get to see you when in Israel, hopefully maybe even in the upcoming spring mission that the AFSI, the Chizuk mission that AFSI does. Um, I know a lot of our members are working hard in their own ways, whatever they can do, and and uh, will continue to do so. And uh, if you have any closing message, um, I'll, I'm just going to say thank you finally, and please close for us. Close. Okay, look, uh, Israel doesn't have any more energy problems. Uh, uh, we don't have any more water problems. Um, our enemies are collapsing. Um, Gaza uh, situation is going to be radically changed uh, after the war. 
Um, so uh, Syria does not exist anymore. Uh, Iraq does not exist anymore. Lebanon is hanging on a thread. I think it's uh, we're in a situation. Um, oh yeah, there's another thing. Um, the laser cannon is going to be, according to sources, uh, ready in 18 months. So that is why I think uh, Iran was, uh, was pacing was going faster on on its plan. Because once we have the laser gun, so we don't have any more uh, project uh, a security problem with the flying objects, either nuclear or just simple mortar. Uh, it could be all eliminated by through the laser. So uh, and then Mashiach will come, and then we're all set. Fantastic! Thank you again, Ron. We really okay. appreciate your time. I'm Yisrael Khan. Right. My pleasure.